Okay, I can start. So this is a, a very easy talk on observation and experiments. And uh, so it's easy after lunch to follow this talk. And uh, I would like to convince you that we are very close to observe for the first time gravitational waves. This is the outline of uh, the lectures, of this uh, first day lecture. And uh, I, I, I will give you an overview of gravitational wave spectrum, of the astrophysical sources that we expect, and also on the gravitational wave detector. I will talk to you about the first generation of ground-based detector. Uh, you know that uh, they were not able to detect gravitational waves, but uh, uh, they proved that uh, the technology that we have is good to have uh, first detection, and they prepared the base for the second generation of detector. So I will talk about the second generation, and uh, I want to say to you that we are very nearby to the first uh, observation of this second generation because LIGO, we start to observe that is one of the gravitational wave ground based interferometer, we start to observe this September. And Virgo will follow LIGO in 2016. And uh, I want to give you uh, the, uh, the idea of the importance to have a network of gravitational wave detectors. And I will show you some scientific results of the first generation of this detector and what are the perspectives for the next years. So this slide shows you the gravitational wave spectrum. Uh, it's a spectrum that we have to open. We never observe directly uh, the spectrum. And you know that uh, all we know about the universe come uh, uh, from a wavelet wavelength observation. And uh, so to open this, spe this spectrum will allow, will allow us uh, to observe all these type of sources that go, go from cosmic strings, uh, supermassive black hole binaries, uh, uh, stellar, mass, uh, bi stellar mass compact object binaries, uh, spinning neutron star, core collapse of massive star. So we have a totally new messenger to study this object. We will focus to the spectrum from nanohertz to 10 to the 3 hertz. And to observe this, uh, the gravitational waves coming from these uh, sources, we have very different uh, uh, detectors that go from pulsar timing array, space detector, and ground-based detector. These are the astrophysical sources that we expect. And uh, here you can see frequency and the characteristic strain. Characteristic strain is uh, without dimension, give us uh, the, the length change that uh, our sources produce uh, when they pass, when gravitational will pass. And uh, they, are, they represent the amplitude of the sources and uh, they are uh, the square root of the energy emitted in gravitational waves. So uh, starting from the lower frequency, we have uh, as uh, most promising sources the stochastic background that is given by the super superposition of uh, a signal from supermassive binary and cosmological background. Then we have the supermassive black hole binaries. Here we are talking about objects with a mass of 10 to the 9 solar masses. Then we go in the range observed by this one, that is the range observed by the satellite. And uh, here we have uh, mass, uh, we can have uh, uh, extreme mass ratio in spiral in which we have uh, a supermassive black hole of uh, mass larger than 10 to the 6 and uh, stellar mass black hole that is uh, orbiting around. And then we have uh, massive binaries with, black, with mass around 10 to the 4, 10 to the 7, and also galactic white dwarf binaries. And then in this regime, we have the stellar mass black hole, and we can have core collapse of supernovae or rotating neutron star sources. What you can see is that if we go to lower frequency, we have 
more massive object with respect to higher frequency, and the amplitude of this object has, is higher. These are astrophysical sources also from the point of view of uh, the signal that they emit are very different. We have uh, sources that, uh, for which we know very well from GR the, uh, the waveform that they emit, but there is also sources like, for example, supernovae for which uh, we don't know well the waveform, so we can consider them and model sources. So the searches for this object is different from the one that we know very well, the waveforms. And uh, here are the sources. So you can see that the amplitude increase with mass, but we need to compare this with the sensitivity of the instrument that we have now and that we will have in the near future. So starting from here, here is the regime of uh, uh, pulsar timing array. So we can use uh, the pulsars, in particular the millisecond pulsars. We know about now 300 millisecond pulsars from radio and gamma ray observation. And uh, we cannot use all of them for this type of studies. But uh, we can use uh, the uh, pulse time arrival of this pulsar uh, to see if uh, a gravitational wave is passed through them because the gravitational waves uh, disturb, influence this pulse timing arrival. And uh, we know that uh, millisecond pulsar are very, very precise clock. So if the gravitational wave pass, we have, uh, we have uh, residuals between the uh, pulse time arrival and uh, observed with respect to, with respect to what, uh, what is the prediction. If we have only one pulsar, we cannot uh, say, say nothing because uh, there is also intrinsic noise in each pulsar. And so we need many pulsars that works as an array. For each of them, we evaluate these residuals. We correlate the residuals. And in this way, we are able to estimate, to see if uh, there is uh, this, uh, uh, this gravitational wave that passes through them. So we can consider the pulsar timing array as a, a big uh, a galactic scale interferometer. And uh, now, this is, uh, this is the sensitivity of the European pulsar timing array. And uh, so there are these, uh, these uh, programs in which many antennas observe the skies and point the, the, the pulsar. The pulsar useful for this type of work are the ones that are very bright and th that are very stable. And uh, to improve this sensitivity, we are not very distant, but to improve, the main thing is to increase the number of pulsars to do this type of work. So to increase the number of pulsars in the array. And in the next year, we will have a new instrument that is a SKA. And people expect that at high frequency, we will observe many new pulsars. And so we can increase the number of, of these, of, of, that are useful for this type of, uh, of searches. And so people think that uh, in, uh, in SKR we start in full sensitivity around 2020, so that uh, in the next uh, 10 years, uh, this, uh, type of search, this type of instrument will be able to observe. Someone say also before. And now they are developing all the technique uh, to, to improve and to try also to to better this sensitivity. Then we have this part that is the. Uh, the so uh, about this, uh, I, I can say th this is a. Uh, uh, you can you can go there. There is the the paper, and there is what they assume for the sto the stochastic background. But they assume some models, so it's. Uh, it's not so, I, I cannot say this is all the stochastic background or uh, uh, they assume some model for this. Okay. So uh, here is the place of uh, space satellite. 
And uh, uh, here we need, uh, uh, so also here what happens is that we, we need to observe these, uh, these uh, uh, sources. Uh, um, we, we need to use a technique that is uh, based on interferometers. And the harm of the interferometers in these space satellites are around 10 to the 9 meters. The first project was LISA, about this uh, space satellite able to detect gravitational waves. And the idea was of three satellites in which in each of them uh, there is a test, a test mass and the a laser beam within these uh, three satellites. And uh, then uh, the project the, it was a NASA European project. Then the, the NASA decided to go out from this project. And so now it's a only European project that is called ELISA. It's only two satellites. And the distance is, uh, I think, uh, LISA was 5 per 10 to the 9 meters. And uh, ELISA is uh, 10 to the 9 meter. Uh, LISA is a very good uh, way to detect gravitational wave because there are uh, binary sources that we know that are in the sky, and so you can point them and observe directly and wait uh, integrated in time and so uh, observe the, the gravitational waves. It's very, they, these satellites are very good with respect to the ground-based detector because you remove completely the worst noise for the ground-based detector that I will show you better later, that is the seismic noise. So in the space, you have not seismic noise, and this is extremely good. Uh, in the space, you can have uh, a background that is given by the superposition of the unresolved sources, for example, the white, the white dwarf binary sources, but you don't have uh, seismic noise. So, what is the prospect for, uh, for ELISA? So ELISA will be evaluated to be launched in uh, 2034. So not, not very nearby. But this year is very important because uh, the science of ELISA is something that is very good uh, and everyone recognizes it is extremely good what uh, ELISA can we do. Uh, but uh, the technology, satellites are very difficult, and also to think about uh, test mass uh, and satellite divided by many, many kilometers that uh, exchange last beam, and so it's, it's something, it's, it's a new technology. And this year, there will be the Pathfinder. So there will be a very small LISA, but uh, that uh, will try to test the technology. So I think it's, uh, it's a very important step also uh, for the acceptance of this, of this project. And then we go to the one more familiar for me, that is the ground-based detector. This is the initial LIGO in Virgo, and you can see here, this is the... Um, this is the binary system of uh, solar mass compact object. This is supernovae, and this is pulsar. So we were very nearby to detect something, and I will show you why we didn't detect nothing that is mainly linked to the rate of these type of sources. But uh, this is the future, the nearby future. So this is uh, advanced LIGO and Virgo. And I will show you in which way we, we will arrive to this sensitivity course. Here on the top, I, I put all the detector that will contribute to the advanced network. And here we show better this plot because it's something very exciting because uh, it's a, a picture of a few days ago. Yeah. The supernova is here. Uh, what stands, like, in, in our yeah, I will show you later because the it seems uh, the the okay, it seems that from the last simulation that the energy emitted by supernovae is very small. 
And uh, so for the initial LIGO and Virgo, the maximum distance was uh, about 10 kiloparsecs, so very nearby. Also for the advanced detector, for some model, we have uh, a distance that is within our galaxies. There is more optimistic model that I will show you later better that predict uh, larger distance. But typically, the supernova is expected to be seen in the local galaxies, not very distant. And so this is very exciting because it's a picture of, uh, it's a plot of the sensitivity curve of LIGO because LIGO is now in the commissioning phase. I told you that it will start to observe in uh, September. And uh, the things are going very, very well for the commissioning. And they already arrived to a distance for a binary system that is better than what they expected before. Okay, so I will go to the first generation of ground-based detector. This is only to remember you that we are almost 100 years uh, since the Einstein predicted these new type of waves, so gravitational waves. They are generated by mass distribution with time-varying quadrupole moments. They're propagating at the speed of life, and they change the distance between station stationary inertial mass. And this is uh, the way we use this, uh, this change in length uh, to detect them. According to GR, they have two in independent polarization states, uh, and each signal can be described as H, as a linear combination of uh, H plus, so these two, two polarization, A plus and H cross, H cross. We know that they exist because uh, we know in a, in a in direct way, because uh, we know that uh, we have this, uh, this, is, uh, this was the first binary pulsar discovered. And uh, looking at these uh, binary pul pulsars, and we uh, make many observations. This, uh, this plot is, uh, is uh, very interesting because we, we have observation from 75 to, to 2000 also now. And these are all the observations. So we have these orbitating stars. They lose energy. And there was a prediction by Einstein about the energy lose by, in gravitational wave by this type of system. And you can see the line. You don't see very, <laughs> the line is not clear. But the line is perfectly under the observation. And so this is a very strong proof of their existence. But it's really very hard to detect them because uh, they have a very weak interaction with matter. Is the reason why they are so important to, to see them because they are very powerful probes of uh, uh, regions that uh, are opaque to, to photons. So with them, we can directly, I don't know, estimate mass, spin, things that typically we estimate only in an indirect way by photons. But uh, the, re the same reason for which they are so interesting is the same reason, the reason for which they are very, very difficult to detect. So these are the most promising sources, binary system. They emit gravitational waves. The gravitational waves deform space. This is a cartoon. And uh, so, the displacement is proportional to the length. You see, you have a delta L that is uh, proportional to L and HT. And uh, this is called strain. Do we know to detect uh, very, very small? I will show you later how, how much small uh, displacement. Yes, this comes from, uh, from Michelson. We can use uh, interferometers. And we can use laser light beam. So we have changing lens. If you are able to measure the effect on the light of this displacement, we can, we can uh, uh, measure the gravitational waves. In particular, this is a simple uh, way in which we can represent an interferometer. Here we have two mass. We have two mirror, suspended mirror, that are, that are our test mass. Here we have a laser. The laser 
emit uh, a, a light here. The light is divided into the two mirror, in, into the two, uh, these two arms. And if there is the, the, the gravitational wave that pass, we can, have, we can have different light, different arms. And so when the light go here and come back, when come back here, we have some light that go to the photodiode. If, they, if no gravitational wave pass through them, the length of the, of the arms are the same. So when the light come back, there is a destructive interference, and so we don't have light to the photo, photodiode. So I give you some number. If we take a neutron star binary at the distance of 15 megaparsec, and we want to evaluate, this is the strain, so delta L over L. This is the target sensitivity for this type of sources at 15 megaparsec, that is 10 to the minus 22. We are able to detect them because we have these kilometer interferometers. And these kilometer, in, kilometer arms interferometers are able to measure length change of the order of 10 to the minus 90 meter. And was, this was proved by the initial ligand Virgo. So we are able to measure few order of magnitude length change smaller than the size of an atomic nucleus. And now I will show in a very simple way the first generation that proved this. And uh, so here you have again frequency against, uh, this is amplitude. This is a, a strain in a different, it's a bit different strain with respect to the one that I show you before because uh, this is the square root of the power spectral density. Is the power, uh, is the amplitude uh, density. Is so the, the power divided by frequency is another way to show the strain. And it's useful mainly for the sources that, uh, there are many sources that uh, change uh, dramatically their, uh, uh, their frequency, the power in, in each frequency when, when they are in the, in the band of LIGO and Virgo. And uh, so this is uh, the sensitivity of the initial LIGO. And this is an example of neutron star, neutron star at 15 megaparsec. This is the merger. This is the, the in spiral, in spiral, the last phase of the spiral, more or less the last 20 seconds of the spiral. And so in, uh, in the band of LIGO, the, the, for neutron star, neutron star, the main region is, uh, is the, the region detectable is the one of the spiral. So this is uh, what I showed you before. We have this mirror. In reality, in the arms, we have two mirror, and I show you why. And the photodiode and the, 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 the laser machine. So this is the first uh, uh, noise that we have in this detector. So uh, the input power is 10 watt, more or less, and uh, this uh, power is increased to 15 kilowatt. This is thanks to these uh, this two mirror, because uh, they, they are uh, the so-called power recycle, recycling cavity. So when the light is here, the light go back and forward through these, uh, through these arms. And uh, this cavity is uh, an amplitude resonant, uh, created an amplitude resonant uh, amplification. So you can consider the power of our laser 15 kilowatt. So uh, the main, one of the main noise sources is the quantum noise. The quantum noise is due to the random arrival of photons. <laughs> And this generated the so-called short noise and also generate a uh, radiation pressure on the mirror. If we 
improve, if we increase the power of the laser, what happens is that we can reduce a lot the quantum noise here. And it is what is happening now with the second generation. But at the same time, if we increase the power, we increase the radiation pressure on the mirror. And so here you can see that uh, in the second generation, we have a higher quantum noise. So at high frequency, we can reduce a lot the quantum noise. So to increase sensitivity, we have two ways. One is to reduce this noise by increase the power of the, of the laser. And the other is to build very, very long uh, interferometers. That is not so easy, because these one are kilometer. 400 kilometer and 300 kilometer. And so, uh, sorry, three, four kilometer. <laughs> and uh, so increase to 100 kilometer is, is really very difficult. What? Pressure, pressure radiation is uh, the power of the beam that, uh, mm, this is the, the the mirror, and so it's a pressure on the mirror. And this creates vibration, and this creates this uh, mainly at low frequency, this, uh, this very big noise. In this case, if you have a higher power, you directly have a higher pressure. And I'll show you later with how, in how much increase here. The, 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 the mirror that uh, people use now in the second generation are very good for this. So it's the structure of the mirror mainly uh, with respect to the, to the past. With the past mirror, the one of the initial LIGO and Virgo, it would not be possible to have higher power, uh, um, our pow higher power uh, laser. This is the second uh, source of noise, that is the seismic noise. This creates like a wall at low frequency. Uh, this is due to the random motion of the ground that is produced by car, by wind, by people around the interferometer. In some, mo in some moment, this background increases a lot. For example, when there are earthquakes, and when there are, for example, ocean waves, sea waves. And in the first generation, what happened is that you have to stop the interferometer and then wait that the every come back in a stable way and then open again the interferometer. For the future, this is not possible because the power of the beam is extremely high. And so if you stop the interferometer and then you open again the interferometer, you, you can keep you can lose a lot of time of observation. And so the way to reduce this noise uh, and also to, to avoid this uh, 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 close of, of the interferometer is to have uh, a very uh, sophisticated con system of control of this type of noise. And Virgo was very good also in the first generation because uh, over the uh, mirror that is suspended, there is a, se a seven meter column of uh, pendula, and each of them are able to filter seismic noise uh, in all directions. So to reduce this noise, you have to, to build a very good uh, system control. These are the, the third noise, that is the thermal noise. And this is due to the, I don't know, increase on temp temperature. This creates uh, excitation of the pendulum. And uh, are vibrations so due to temperature increase, but are due also to when the mechanical quality of the system is not really very good, and uh, mainly of the suspension. And so in the future, they are uh, there are a lot of attention to make a very stable uh, mechanical system to, to reduce this, uh, also the thermal. All this system is in vacuum. The vacuum is about 10 to, 10 to the minus 7 torr. 
And this is due to the fact that the light has not to interact with molecules that can perturb the light. So, these are the current uh, uh, interferometers. So we have LIGO, the two LIGO in the United States, we have Virgo and GEO. So LIGO is a four kilometer arm array uh, v interferometer, Virgo is a three kilometer. So there is, a, you, you can see in the sensitivity curve that there is a, a bit of difference. And then we have GEO, and GEO is uh, smaller because it's a 600 meter. And uh, GEO is uh, typically used for te technological test. While these three work, uh, worked in the past uh, together as a network. So this is the sensitivity course. So this is uh, LIGO, this is Virgo. The difference here is due to the uh, different uh, length of the arms. Here you can see that Virgo was very good at low frequency for the seismic control. And this is GEO. You can see this peak. These peak are uh, due to vibration of the suspension system that are due to, uh, to the environment, to the electronic magnetic disturbances. So these, uh, these peaks are typical of this type of, of uh, sensitivity course. I think that I didn't say you before is that uh, there are also in the noise uh, some transient event. And uh, that are linked, I don't know, also to earthquake, also to many environmental uh, disturbances. And this transient event uh, that are a lot uh, mimic the transient sources. So over these, these curves, over this peak, over the noise, we have many of these, uh, of these transient uh, uh, events that are very similar to the signal and that require a very deep study to be, to be removed and to be controlled. So the advanced, the advanced we, can, we will have more laser power. You can see here the number. So we will arrive the, uh, to one megawatt. So it's, it's really a lot. So this is the previous plot that I show you. You can see that uh, the quantum noise is uh, reduced a lot, but we have an increase here, the radiation pressure. This is uh, what we we'll, will be obtained with the thermal noise, with a better mechanical quality. And we will suspend the, the mass with uh, glass fibers and so on. This is uh, what we will obtain with uh, a better seismic isolation. And so this is what we expect. This was uh, the sensitivity curve for a neutron star, neutron star, uh, the sensitivity curves, and I told you that neutron star, neutron star, we, we was able to detect them up to 50 megaparsec. Now we will be able to detect them up to 150 megaparsec. So we will have an increase in sensitivity of a factor 10 in distance so that corresponds to a factor 10 to the 3 in volume, so 10 to the 3 in the number of sources that we will be able to detect. Now I'll show you why it is important to have a network and not only one interferometer. And the main reason is uh, the directional sensitivity. So this is uh, the antenna partner, pattern of these type of interferometers. The, uh, the sensitivity, this is the plot, is, uh, this is the antenna pattern, is uh, a peanuts uh, shape. And uh, you can see that uh, these objects are able to 
to monitor all sky. They are nearly omnidirectional. The only place uh, is, uh, is here where we have uh, a bit lower sensitivity. And in particular, this is the two arms. So if we have a source in the plane with the pro propagation in the plane of the of the detector and the 45 degree, in this case, we have n uh, a null sensitivity. But in general, it's a very good all sky monitor. I remember you that differently from the electromagnetic, uh, the, the Hertz is uh, transparent to gravitational waves, so we can detect from everywhere gravitational waves. But uh, this type of, uh, of uh, of um, detector have uh, not a good directional sensitivity. So it's not a pointing instrument. So it's very difficult to understand where come the signal, where is the, the direction of the signal. They have a very, very poor angular resolution that is about 100 degree. And this is the reason why it's important to, the main reason why it's important to have a network, because in this case, with a network, we are able to uh, determine the sky position of the gravitational wave sources by triangulation. So what we do is to measure the difference in the signal arrival times uh, uh, at the different network site. And uh, this is for two interferometers. And in particular, the region of uh, constant delay is a hanulus in the sky when we have two detectors. And this hanulus is concentric to the baseline of the two detectors. And with three detectors, that is the way in which we, we can have a good sky localization, is uh, the intersection of these uh, three hanulus. And in particular, we have, so where they interse intersect here and here. So we have the real position of the sources, but also we have uh, the image, the mirror image of, this, uh, of the real position of the sources and this, with respect to the, to the plane of the three interferometers. So these are more or less uh, the, if we, if we consider that the uh, lambda of gravitational wave is very big, and this is the, the distance between, more or less the distance between two interferometers, like Lyco and Virgo. The <laughs> angular resolution is 60 degree, but we can improve with, uh, with three interferometers. And what you can understand is that uh, from here, that if we have longer base baseline and a network of many, many detectors all around the world, we can uh, clearly improve a lot the sky localization capabilities. Uh, we have other benefits from uh, using a network. We can increase the sensitivity, and the sensitivity increase with the square root of the number of, uh, of the uh, interferometers. We can have uh, a larger observational time because each interferometer has uh, a duty cycle, so a period in which they don't observe. And so if we have a network, we can, uh, we can at least have two detectors on, and so we can increase the observational time. It's also more useful to make uh, uh, the, uh, allow better to make the parameter reconstruction of the uh, parameter of the sources. And it is also useful for the, the things that I told you before, that we have these, a lot of these glitches in the noise. And so we can remove these glitches because they, they are not correlated between the different, the different uh, interferometers. So Virgo and LIGO has, uh, have signed in the past an agreement for a full data exchange and for a joint analysis of the data. And uh, this is what will be also for the future. And so LIGO and Virgo will observe the sky uh, as a single network. And uh, here I put some number for the sky localization capability. If we take a neutron star, neutron star with a signal to noise ratio of seven, 
we will have for a source, in the best case, uh, when the source is face-on with respect to, to our detector, uh, not, uh, it's, I can say, is, uh, is uh, when the source is over, so is, uh, is, um, is directly over the plane of the, dete the detector, we will have a sky localization of 20 square degree and uh, a medium volume of 40 square degree. So when we say good sky localization, you have not to think uh, absolutely to the electromagnetic. For the electromagnetic point of view, this is a very, very poor uh, sky localization. This is the near future. The near future we will have, so the three interferometers, but we have also two projects. Indigo, that is uh, one of uh, LIGO and Ford. In uh, Enford, uh, there were in the past uh, two interferometers. One of them will be moved to India. And uh, in 2020, we can have another interferometer in India. And then we have Kagra in Japan. There is two phases. The first phase uh, that of observation that we, will start in 2018. This is uh, an underground detector to reduce the seismic noise. And it's also think to be cryogenic, but this will be in a second phase after 2020. So now we go to uh, the astrophysical source detectable by ground-based detector and some science result from initial LIGO and Virgo and the prospects for the advanced detector. So uh, the, we have different type of sources. One of them are the ones that give rise to transient event, transient gravitational wave signal. And uh, these uh, are signal with a duration in the detective sensitive band uh, that are short and shorter than the observation time and that cannot be reobserved re the second time. The typical example are the coalescence of compact objects. So stellar mass uh, black hole, so we can have neutron star, neutron star, or neutron star, black hole, or black hole, black hole uh, um, coalescence. Or we can have uh, also core collapse of massive star. These are the, the most promising uh, transient sources. Uh, for this type of sources, we know ve very well the waveforms mainly in the spiral phase that I showed you before that for neutron star, neutron stars is uh, perfectly in the band of, of the detector. And uh, we know also the energy emitted that is 10 to the minus 2 solar masses for square uh, light, light velocity square. So uh, these are what uh, LIGO, initial LIGO and Virgo was able to do, that is uh, to observe binary containing a neutron star, so neutron star, neutron star, neutron star, black hole, up to 50 megaparsec. This number is the best distance. The best distance is uh, obtaining the place where you, your detector is more sensitive, and for a, a, uh, the better orientation of, or, of your system that is face on. So the orbitating plane perpendicular to the line of sight. And uh, the likely rate at this distance, the astrophysical rate that we expect, uh, I will, I will show you that uh, these rates are very, very uncertain, but in any case, it's 0.02. So very, very low. So this is the reason why we were not able to detect nothing up to now. For the core collapse of massive star, in this case, uh, the, the waveform is very uncertain. We don't know the asymmetry of uh, the explosion. It's very difficult to simulate also the microphysics in this, in this explosion. And uh, the most recent 3D simulation from Christian Ott uh, give an energy emitted in gravitational waves that is 
10 to the minus 8. So very smaller with respect to the binary system. There are more optimistic models that predict 10 to the minus 4. So as I told before, uh, we expect to detect these sources. Uh, in the past, we, we expected to detect these sources within our galaxies in the future in the local galaxies. This is what will happen in the future. So LIGO, I show you that uh, give rise to a density, a, a distance improvement of a factor 10 that corresponds to a factor uh, 10 to the 3 in the, the number of detectable sources. Here I indicated the rate for binary system. And you can see these are the rate. What we call the more likely rate. And uh, you can see here that uh, what we, are, we will expect in full sensitivity for LIGO and Virgo, so LIGO and Virgo as a network, is more or less one event per week. But these rates are extremely uncertain. And I will show you what the, the way in which uh, you can estimate the rate. But if, if we believe to this number, we are really very close to observe uh, a lot of gravitational wave signal. Here I also put some number on the distance up to which LIGO and Virgo will be able to observe this system. These number are the so-called is uh, the distance uh, obtaining, obtained uh, uh, making an average that take into account the sensitivity of the network and also that make an average on the orientation of the, of the system. And you can see that we, 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 we will uh, see neutron star, neutron star up to a distance of 200 megaparsec. And I will use this number a lot in the, in the lecture of tomorrow to show you what we expect also from the electromagnetic point of view from these type of sources. So uh, for the core collapse of massive star, there is the problem that I told you before. We don't expect a lot of energy on it. There are optimistic models. These optimistic models are models in which uh, during the explosion there could be some uh, uh, fragmentation of the core collapse, of the core that are collapsing, or we can have some uh, instabilities in the accretion disk. I, I will show you tomorrow that uh, uh, supernovae are associated to long gamma ray burst, and in this case you have this uh, unstable accretion disk, uh, and this uh, instability can create uh, a higher gravitational wave emission. And in this case, we can have uh, also, these are extremely optimistic, also to arrive to 100 megaparsec. I come back uh, one, a second on the, on the rate. How are estimate the rate? The rate come from the, the rate, the detection rate come from the, uh, the expected merge rate of this system. And there are different ways now to estimate this, uh, this rate. One of them is to use the population synthesis code. In this code, what they do is a simulation in which they, the binaries forms and evolve isolated, in which they assume some recipe of stellar evolution. And uh, you can see here that the these different also stellar evolution recipes give rise to very big uncertainty in these, uh, in these uh, numbers. And we are not able to constrain these, uh, uh, now we are not able to constrain this uh, these number a lot because uh, we have, from the observational point of view, we have only nine neutron star, neutron star system observed. Also, one more of this system can allow us to reduce a lot this, uh, this uncertainty. From the point of view of uh, neutron star black hole and black hole black hole, we never observed them from an electromagnetic point of view. And so we, this one uh, black, black hole black hole, we also don't expect to observe in electromagnetic, but this, yes. And uh, so it's, uh, 
it's impossible really to reduce this uncertainty because we, we are not helped from the observational point of view. Now there are also different type of simulation. These simulation are hand body simulation and Monte Carlo simulation that uh, uh, focus on the environment that seems very important for this type of system and focus on globular cluster and young star cluster. Uh, here we have a higher density of stars, so a higher density of this type of object, of compact object. We have uh, uh, dynamically exchange and uh, we can produce more, um, more uh, uh, of this system. And so we can say that uh, we take into account the facts that in this case uh, we don't take into account. But the number are, are in any case very similar and also the range is, is very big, is very large. So the uncertainty are very large. Now we have also another way to estimate the rate, the merge rate, but also this one has a lot of uncertainties. It is this one, true gamma ray burst. If you assume that, uh, I will talk more tomorrow about gamma ray bars, but we, if we assume that uh, all gamma ray, ray bars that we observe in the sky come from neutron star, neutron star, we can try to estimate the neutron star, neutron star uh, uh, merge rate. But in any case, you can see that uh, these plots show many orders, so it's really very difficult to, to to restrict, to constrain this rate of merger. This is, uh, yes, per mega year. Is, this is for megaparsec square and mega year. Sometimes these rates are given in uh, uh, Milky Way equivalent instead of megaparsec per, per cubic megaparsec. I, I, I don't listen. These one are uh, detection rate. So in, in this one, you have to take into account the volume. So uh, you, you can take, uh, so this one, this number here, are exactly these uh, here. Come exactly from this here. And what you do is uh, to evaluate the merger rate for uh, equivalent Milky Way galaxies, and then you extrapolate to your volume, uh, uh, to the volume up to which your, uh, your uh, detector is sensitive. So they come exactly from here. So it's, okay, uh, the, the rate is uncertain. We hope that the more likely is, uh, is the one that will give us many many detection, but what I want to say is that in any case, uh, uh, also to have non-detection from the astrophysical point of view is very important because uh, also to have, I don't know, two years of no observation of gravitational wave of full sensitivity will give us, uh, uh, from an astrophysical point of view, put uh, strong constraint on the stellar evolution model. So these are the, uh, the binary system. Here I have, uh, I don't know, it, I think that the sound is not possible to listen. <laughs> In any case, this is uh, what happened and uh, the, I go on. So the, the signal is uh, embedded in this very bad noise. I have also the sound, but it's impossible to you to listen. So we have this, uh, you can see here, this is the signal and this is the noise. So it's very complicated also from the point of view of the analysis to extract this, uh, this uh, signal from the noise. And uh, for the coalescence of compact object, what we use is this, uh, mainly this phase. We know the waveforms. The waveforms depend on uh, intrinsic parameters and extrinsic parameters. The intrinsic parameters are mainly masses and spin of the system. And then we have also eccentricity, neutron star compactness, tidal deformability, 
And then we have extrinsic parameters that are location, distance, merger time, and system orientation with respect to the observer. But we use a lot, and help us a lot, to use the, the knowledge of the waveform. And uh, so what we do is, uh, in the detection phase, uh, we know waveform, and we use match filtering. We use template, and the template use uh, not all the parameters, so we fix the parameters. And we use template that cover big range of masses and spin, and uh, the extrinsic parameters are absorbed in the amplitude. And so we make a correlation using these, uh, these uh, waveforms. This is the first phase of the analysis. This is the second phase of the analysis in which we use uh, the template with all these uh, 15 parameters, our, our waveform with 15 parameters. And uh, then, so this is a longer, uh, take long, uh, clearly, this, uh, this analysis. And uh, so after the detection, we will make this uh, source parameter reconstruction that will allow us to have information on uh, masses, spins, distance, sky localization, and so on. This was, with this type of analysis, we, uh, we run over the data, this analysis, and uh, what we found was uh, we, we didn't make any detection, and we put some upper limit, uh, so the non-detection allow us uh, to put upper limit on the rate and this is what we obtained. This is the exclusion region. So this is no detection corresponded to this upper limit on the rate. This is for objects with a mass between 2 and 25 solar masses. For the neutron star, this rate corresponds to 135 solar masses. Uh, this is the total masses. This is the mass of the component. And this is uh, the black hole used for this rate. So you can see that. Uh, we were distant from the astrophysical rate that are the one that I showed you before. This is what will happen with the advanced detector. So we, we think that uh, we are nearby to the, to the detection. As I told you before, also not observe a gravitational wave allow us to put big constraint on the stellar evolution. And uh, so we hope to, to observe this type of sources, to observe for the first time black hole, black hole, and black hole neutron star, to put constraint on the evolution, and also to, to shed light on the, on the birth and evolution of black hole. And also uh, another, another thing that uh, is uh, a lot of debate now is uh, uh, the mass distribution of black hole. And the only way to know in a direct way, the mass distribution of black hole is uh, through this uh, gravitational wave messenger. These are the unmodeled transients. So uh, we have core collapse of massive star. We can have uh, cosmic strings. We can have uh, neutron star instability, so star quake in a neutron star that are visible in, in the electromagnetic. I will show tomorrow. And so. Uh, this creates uh, a non-radial oscillation that can give rise to gravitational waves. We don't know the waveform, so they are very poorly modeled, and so we cannot use a match filter. And what we look for is uh, for excess power. So we make a whole sky, all time search for transient, for the increase in power in uh, some, some time frequency region. And we look for this excess. This is an injection. And uh, so the assumption in this type of analysis is the duration of the, of the signal that uh, need to be less than one second. This is, I think, uh, is between 1 and 100 milliseconds. And this is the frequency range in which we perform this, uh, this uh, search, is a 60 to 2,000 hertz, and uh, we use a lot the network in this case. Um, first of all, because the network allow, allow us to, 
to reduce the fossil arrays, so these glitches that are not uh, uh, co coherent in all the detector. And this is an example. For example, you can see that uh, this is uh, to spike due to the noise, and these are due to an injection. And so we can remove this type of uh, event that are very similar to, this, to these bars. This is uh, a result of uh, initial LIGO and Virgo. And uh, so the non-detection allow us to put, uh, uh, to make uh, this plot that give us the energy up to which uh, LIGO and Virgo would be able to see. So if we take a source at uh, 10 megaparsec, we are sure that uh, uh, the energy emitted, uh, we, we would see a, an energy of this source is higher than this. So if uh, during the observation of LIGO and Virgo, there were uh, uh, pulse, for example, from the galactic center, that is more or less this distance, uh, they, we were able to detect them. And since the energy emitted in gravitational waves is proportional to the distance to the, the uh, distance to the second, we, we can see that uh, we need three, a factor, a very high factor, uh, more energy for a signal detectable from the Virgo. Uh, here I put this, this okay, this, uh, so, uh, this plot was obtained making injection in the data and uh, so injected some uh, transient signal and we use this type of waveform. You, you, you cannot see here well the, I'm sorry, the plot, but we use very simple uh, burst event like sine Gaussian or Gaussian. Other sources, these are continuous gravitational wave signal. So rotating neutron star can emit uh, gravitational waves, can emit uh, uh, if they are asymmetric. They can emit uh, uh, quasi-periodic waves whose frequency change in a very, very slow way. The signal expected from these sources is very, very weak but is a continuous signal. And so we can integrate it, our observation, for example, for years, and try to improve the signal to noise ratio and try to detect this type of, uh, of event. And uh, we performed two types of searches, one uh, all sky, all frequency. And the other one was uh, pointing, if you want, is not pointing, I explain you what I mean, but we make a search on the known pulsars. What we do is to take all the data of gravitational wave data, but to restrict the parameter search by looking at the same sky position of the, of the known pulsars and at the same frequency of the pulsars. So we use what we know from the electromagnetic point of view, the position, and the frequency of the pulsars in the gravitational wave search. And this is what we obtained. These are, all these points correspond to a pulsars. And uh, for each pulsars, we know from the electromagnetic point of view the, uh, the um, rotational energy that the pulsar lose and uh, we, we can uh, estimate for each pulsar the so-called spin down limit. The spin down limit is uh, the, if we assume that all the rotational energy lose is due to gravitational waves, we can say this is the spin down limit. This is the the, uh, is something that we estimated from an, a, the electromagnetic point of view. And for each of these pulsars, we have 
we have this limit, so no observation of gravitational waves tell us that uh, the energy emitted from these pulsars is uh, lower with respect to this, emitted in, uh, uh, as a rotational loss. And uh, these are, all these points are the spin down limit corresponding to these sources. So to each of these sources, we have the, the, the so-called spin down limit. Uh, I want to say you that here are the region of uh, young pulsars, that one that uh, lose more rapidly the rotational energy. And here are the region of the millisecond pulsars. Low frequency here is better Virgo. All these pulsars were, were studied by Virgo. Here is better LIGO, and so all these pulsars were, were studied by LIGO. For two of these pulsars, we were able to beat uh, the spin down limit. The two pulsars are CRAB and VILA. You see here, this is uh, CRAB and VILA. So for these sources, we discover that uh, the energy loss, the rotational energy loss, cannot be explained totally as gravitational waves. So we have other phenomena for which our pulsars lose rotational energy because our points are lower with respect to these two points. These allow us, assuming some model, also to put some uh, constraint on the ellipti ellipticity, because the energy emitted in gravitational wave depends on the ellipticity. So we, we know that for Crab, the ellipticity is less than this number, so a very small number. And also for Vila, the ellipticity is smaller than 6 per 10 to the minus 4. So these objects are not very asymmetric. This is the uh, stochastic background. I am not a uh, very expert of this part. But uh, so the stochastic background is the superposition of many uh, incoherent and not resolvable sources. Many of them can be astrophysical. So astrophys from the astrophysical point of view, we can have uh, uh, compact binaries, rotating neutron star, magnetar, supernovae, also very distant, but that LIGO and Virgo are not too, too resolved, and so we, we see them as a background. Or we can have a cosmological background. So uh, we can have inflections, cosmic superstring, alternative cosmology. And uh, what happens? In this case, the stochastic background, if we have only one detector, uh, the stochastic background is a noise for the detector. So it's like uh, the noise that I show you at the beginning. And so it's, uh, it's really very hard to try to, to see this noise over the other component, to discriminate this noise with respect to the other component of the noise, also because it's, uh, I showed you before, it's really very difficult to, to have a a complete knowledge of all the noise of the detector. And so the technique to, to, to try to, to see the, the stochastic background is to use uh, a network again and uh, to make uh, a cross correlation because the noise due to the stochastic background is correlated between the detector but not the noise of the single detectors the noise, uh, the real noise. So this was uh, what LIGO and Virgo were able to do and was, uh, they, they surpasses the indirect limit from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. These are the estimated different frequency of LIGO and Virgo, initial LIGO and Virgo. This is the point corresponding to this energy in gravitational waves. 
uh, this is the advanced light, what we expect from advanced LIGO in Virgo. Here, if you look at, at inflection, you see that uh, this background is very flat. And uh, so the dominant component is the one from uh, astrophysical sources, black hole, binary neutron stars. These are the region of cosmic strings. And uh, so with respect to the, for example, the bicep signal, this Virgo is many order of magnitude higher. And uh, also the advanced detector because it's a six order of magnitude. And so the main sources that we expect uh, to detect from the advanced, also the advanced LIGO and Virgo is uh, mainly the astrophysical sources for the, for the background or some, I don't know, ex action inflection or other things. But uh, so we think that uh, the main goal would be to detect something in astrophysical background for the advanced detector. We have to go at very low frequency for, for uh, detection of, uh, of cosmological background. So we can, this is what uh, I, I will show you tomorrow. That is uh, uh, the multi-messenger astronomy because this detector will observe the sky with many other satellites that observe in the electromagnetic uh, bands. And uh, so we develop uh, analysis uh, uh, that use not only gravitational wave, but gravitational wave and electromagnetic information. And also we develop, we, we, uh, we um, organize program to combine the observation to make uh, simultaneous observation of gravitational wave network and uh, electromagnetic instruments. And so I will show tomorrow all this, this part of multi-messenger astronomy. You said that uh, the network increases sen sensitivity. How? The network? Will increase the sensitivity. Yeah. The network increase the sensitivity is, uh, so the sensitivity improve with the, uh, the square root of the number of the detector. Yeah, why? This is due to the, you can say, you can, is uh, come from the signal to noise ratio. And so is is due to the, is due to, to the way in which you estimate the signal to noise ratio. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's very simple, so. Okay, does the position of the network... But, uh, it, but it's not a great improvement. The, I, I can say, uh, I think that uh, the great improvement to have a network in terms of sensitivity, if you think uh, that the main problem is the rate. So if uh, you think that the, the main problem is the rate, for you it's more important to increase uh, the, uh, the observational time. So in terms of sensitivity, uh, a square root on the number doesn't increase you a lot, the sensitivity, so the, the maximum distance. But uh, uh, if you think to the observational time in which you can have uh, a detector on, this increase you, uh, it's more important because it increases you a lot the rate of detection. Does the position of the object of the network influence? That's why you are moving one to India or no? Sorry? Their, their position, the position of the network. Yeah, the position does of it, the... Uh, does it uh, influence so lot. that you are moving now one to India or no? There is, so uh, it's, uh, it's, not to, uh, it's not that you move one to India, but uh, at Enford in the past there was two detectors. And for the advanced detector, we will have only one because to have one detector there 
doesn't improve uh, a lot, no, does improve the, the sensitivity, but doesn't improve the scale localization. And so the idea was to move one of these two that was in Antford to, to India. Longer baseline give you a, a, a better sky localization. So to have a detector in India is, uh, would be extremely good. I will show you tomorrow the difference between sky localization with uh, LIGO India and without. You can go from 100 of square degree of the uh, to LIGO and Virgo to about uh, 10, 20 square degree. I, okay. So, one, uh, so, one, one so there is, uh, I was thinking about an analogy with uh, optical interferometer. Yeah. Is there some analogy? Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah. In, the, in the sky position, in the di direction, you have larger baseline is for you a better sky localization. Yeah, and the, okay. Very good would be one in the south hemisphere. So there was a project of, uh, uh, of one interferometer in Australia. That is very good also for the sky coverage. Any other question? Okay, if not, we. Yeah, there is, no, here. There is one, sorry. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait. wait. The, um, from the noise. And uh, how uh, usually do you solve this problem? What uh, method uh, do you apply, please? So in one case, is when you know the waveform, you can use this match filter. And in the other case, when you have uh, a model sources, is to, to search for this uh, excess power with respect to the noise. And uh, for a model sources that are, for example, transient sources, what we do, for example, uh, for the noise is uh, to use this uh, time shift uh, that allow you to, to understand what are the uh, what are the, um, the the glitch the transient sources that are not correlated with respect to the one that uh, are really signal. So there is a, a very deep uh, and statistical estimate of, of the noise. In the case of uh, match filter, you reduce a lot the the problem of uh, these uh, these glitches. And, but you can make this only for the sources for which you know very, 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 very well the waveforms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Some years ago, I hear about some kind of a sphere, a spheres that are made in order to observe some kind of polarization of gravitational waves. There are, I, I heard some about this sphere in Brazil, but I don't know what happened or what, with the results and if they prove that they can observe something about this? I don't know if now they are active. I think that there was one in Brazil that worked for this. And uh, I think that the system is similar to the bar. So you have uh, this, uh, this, uh, this kind chain. Kind of polarization that they, they try to observe, right? They, they, they can observe also the polarization because it's because this, this, yeah, yeah. But I think that the sensitivity of this type of uh, instruments are really very local, so very nearby, something that happens in, in the galaxy. So I don't know, a supernova in the galaxy maybe that you can see, but I don't think that uh, the sensitivity is, uh, is high, like, like the BARDs. Uh, can we get back to the first slides when you put uh, different uh, detectors, please? Y yes, yeah. the, the last one when you put, okay. So these are, the, no, no, the, the, okay, that's okay. okay. The others, uh, the first two are, w what are in this, uh, in the space, on the ground, or what? The first two, ELISA and... E so this e one is the European Pulsar Timing Array. Yes. This is ELISA, the European LISA. Yes, these are uh, gravitational wave detector, or no? Yeah. And they are on the ground? No, so this is a, spa, a space satellite, ELISA, yes. and the other use pulsars, pulsars in the sky. The, the two are in space? 
these two. So the these, first, are, these uh, are in space. These yeah. are uh, you observe from ground with the radio antenna. Yes. But you use the, the pulsars as an instrument to measure the gravitational waves. So your array is given by the pulsars. Okay. So because uh, I was wondering why, why the shape is sh so sharp here. And, uh, well, the second one uh, should be also more uh, smooth because uh, there is no uh, seismic and thermal, I think. Or no? There are, uh, okay, I, I don't know why this is so really Sharp. steep. I don't yeah. know. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, the fa here and here you have no seismic noise. This yes. is something very important for the sky with respect to to this, uh, to the one that are in the ground. But you have other type of, uh, of noise. And so I, I really don't know why it is uh, in this way, but uh, yeah. For, for Elisa, the main uh, noise will be the background noise, the signal from, for example, from a white dwarf that you are not able to, to see, like uh, uh, you have many unresolved signal altogether. So you, you have an astrophysical noise. Sorry, maybe to just a comment about the, the cusp on the pulsar timing. Maybe that's just because if you look at the, the frequency, it's so low that it's probably just limited that, by that observation by, time. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe so, by the, the pulse, you know, I mean, it probably slowly uh, yeah. marches to the left if you are willing to do a 10-year observation, but that's probably where this it's going. This could be, yeah, yeah. Just, I mean. Any other question? Okay, if uh, not, uh, let's uh, thank Marika and... Uh,